So we need to talk about the properties of transition metals, because it's the transition metals that are going to do most of this fun stuff. Um, so the transition metals seem remarkably similar to each other when we compare them to the main group elements, which vary a lot. And so the transition metals tend to have moderate to high densities, they're good conductors of electricity, have high melting points, and they're moderate to extreme in their hardness. They have similar electron configurations. They all are going to have electrons in the d orbitals. And yet, they are each unique and have a lot of different chemical behaviors. So let's review electron configurations. So what we're looking at here is the first row of the transition metals. Um, so that is period four, right? So potassium and calcium are not transition metals. And so the first one there is scandium. So as, as you build the electron configurations, you're going to come across, well, actually, there's a periodic table just to refresh your memory. So these columns represent the S electrons, and these are P electrons. There's six columns there, 10 columns representing the D electrons, and uh, 14 representing the F electrons. So if we look at the electron configuration for scandium, we've got all of the first three periods filled in. So we can abbreviate that as, OK, electron configuration of argon, and then what's next? What's next? is 4s, 1, 2. So there's two electrons in the 4s. And then this is the 3d block. So one electron in the d. And this would be two in the d, and three in the d, etc. So um, in the first row of the transition metals, we've got ns2, where n is the period number. So that would be 4s2. And the D, that D block is one lower in principal quantum number, so it's N minus 1, so it's 3D and some number of electrons. So there's scandium, it's got one electron in the 3D. Titanium with two, vanadium with three, and then chromium is weird. Um, there are s several exceptions. The only ones that you really have to remember are chromium and copper. We would expect chromium to, to have this electron over here in the 4s, to be 4s2, 3d4. And yet it isn't. It's 4s1, 3d5. And the reason for that is that the 4s and the 3d orbitals are very close in energy. And so for this electron to move from 4s into 3d is only a slight increase in energy. And that's offset by the stabilizing factor of having two exactly full half shells. So the S half shell, subshell, sorry. The S subshell is half full and the D subshell is half full. All these orbitals are half full. That's like a bonus in energy. The other place that happens is with copper. As we keep going along here, after chromium, things behave like we would expect. Manganese is 4s2, 3d5, and then it goes 3d6, 3d7, 3d8, and then copper's weird. We expect 4s2, 3d9, but what happens is that one of the 4s electrons moves over here. Now we have completely full subshell of d electrons and exactly half full in the copper. Okay, so it does that. And then zinc that that next electron will go into the 4s. Um, there, are, there are several other exceptions in the larger transition metals. Uh, so if you come across them, don't be shocked. But I won't expect you to remember them. Um, so when we look at main group elements and we make um, positive ions by removing electrons, we just take off the last two electrons that were added. So we think of the reverse order of filling. How do they fill up? Let's just move backwards. Last in, first out sort of a thing. 
That doesn't happen with the transition metals. It's the valence electrons that are lost first. The valence electrons are in the fourth principal energy level. The 3D electrons are not valence electrons. If, if you'd like to hear my analogy of Mrs. K's Quantum Hotel, a discount resort for electrons, explaining um, electron configurations, I'll be happy to, to share that with you after lecture. Um, in that analogy, this sort of ends up being like a Groupon deal where there's this weird configuration and you get a discount and so they can go up into the more expensive room and have their own beds, but it goes on and on. So the, the 4S electrons are going to be lost first. Okay. Um, there was that. So we should be able to do things like this. Um, write the ground state electron configuration for OS. So that's osmium. So we have to find that on the periodic table. And some of these weird ones, um, you can end up looking for an embarrassingly long period of time before you find them. But osmium's right over here. Um, most of the time, we're just worried about valence electrons. And so we don't need to do the entire electron configuration. We can just start with the previous noble gas. So the noble gas before osmium is xenon. So we'll just start off with xenon. And then we'll write out the configuration for the electrons that come after that. So we've got xenon, and then we go over here. Osmium's in period six. So those first two columns represent S block. So that's 6S, and those are going to get filled up 6S2. And then what happens? And on this periodic table, because of the shape of the space on the wall, we actually have the transition metals where they belong up inside, right? So here's 6s2. And then these guys are the f block. The d block is one less than the period number. The f block is two less than the period number. So after 6s2 comes 4f. And if you forget how many electrons go in there, you can count. There's 14 boxes. So 4F, 14. And then we get over here. Um, now we're in the P block. And I'm sorry, the D block. P block's way over there. Here's, this is the D block. And so that's 5D, right? And we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5D5. So that's the electron configuration for osmium. Any questions? You did this in Chem 1A. So NB2 plus. I believe the name of that one is niobium. It's another weird one we don't hear about much. That's an ion. So when you have an ion, first write the electron configuration for the atom. Okay, so we find niobium on here, and it's in group five. And so we'll start with the previous noble gas, which is krypton. And then we're going to get 5s2. There are no f block elements here. We go directly to d, so that's going to be 4d. And one, two, three. That's the element NB. The ion, two plus charge, we have to take off two electrons. We're going to pull off the valence electrons first. So we're going to remove the 5s electrons. So I'm going to change the superscript there to a 0. And then this is missing two electrons, so it has a positive 2 charge. So sometimes you'll see it written with 5s0, and sometimes you might see it just without the 5s, just 4d3. 
Either one is okay. Any questions? So when we look at the, this is a, a great periodic table that's um, in, I think, chapter 7, or possibly chapter 8, I forget which one, in your book. Um, you can look, and this, this is going to show some of the um, inconsistencies like, you know, platinum's weird, gold's weird, um, silver's weird. But you can look at these and see the valence electrons. The main group's easy. Whatever the group number is. You got it. But here, these D electrons are never valence electrons. So the transition metals are typically going to have two valence electrons. Some of them have one valence electron. We also learned about some periodic trends in Chem 1A, so we're going to review those focusing on the transition metals. Trends in atomic size. So as you go across a row in the periodic table, the general trend is that the atomic size gets smaller. And the reason for that is that you are adding electrons in the same principal shell, but the charge on the nucleus is increasing, and so the effective nuclear charge is going up, and that pulls the electron cloud in closer and makes the elements smaller. So here's, um, I think this is just, what is this, 10. I think that's just the transition elements. So the trend is that you go across and they get smaller. Well, that works just fine for the first few, and then it gets a little muddled. And so we do not see as much of a change in size for the transition elements going across a row as we do for the main group elements. It gets a little bit muddy. In the second row, um, things get even stranger because it goes down and then it goes back up again. Um, and then the third row is almost exactly the same size as the second row. What's up with that? The effective nuclear charge for the uh, transition metals is approximately constant because as you add a proton, you're also adding another core electron, a D electron, and so the, the shielding is such that the nuclear charge is, is roughly the same. So that's why they don't change much in size as you go across. And then going down a group, the first couple of rows what we expect is that as you go down a group that the uh, size of the atom is going to get larger. And that, that works here, um, but other places it doesn't, especially with group uh, the second and the third row. The reason is um, this, the second row of transition elements, you're looking at the 4D electrons. And in the fifth row, I'm sorry. It's confusing talking about rows of transition elements and rows in the periodic table. So the first row of the transition elements, you've just got D electrons. The second row, you've got D electrons. In the third row, there's F electrons. Okay, Those F electrons are core electrons, but you don't have to explain, understand this. You just have to kind of remember it. Those F electrons don't shield very effectively. And so what we see is really no change between the second and third row. Some of them are like right on top of each other. It's called the lanthanide contraction because the, the 4F uh, block there is called lanthanides because the first one's lanthanum. Any questions? Ionization energy, as you go across a row, um, the first ionization energy increases, and that's what is expected. It doesn't increase as sharply as it does across the main group elements, though. As we go down a group, 
Um, in the main group elements, as you get larger atoms going down a group, the ionization energy decreases. Um, the transition metals are opposite. Like if you look at this fourth position here, from the first row to the second row to the third row, the ionization energy actually increases. And that's because the charge of the nucleus is significantly higher, but the size of the atom is about the same. Remember this atomic size thing here? So here, the size of those two atoms is very close, but the number of protons in the nucleus has gone up a lot. So effective nuclear charge says that those outer electrons are being held more tightly, and so it's harder to pull them off. And that's what ionization energy is. Any questions? Electronegativity. Um, fluorine is the most electronegative element, and in general, as you get closer to fluorine, it becomes more electronegative. So we see electronegativity increasing as we go across, as is expected. Um, but as you go down a row, you would expect electronegativity to, to decrease, and it increases, which is, again, against what we expect. So here's first row, and there's the second row. First and second row, third row. So as you're going down in those transition metals, um, the electronegativity generally increases. And again, that has to do with the small size change versus a large change in nuclear charge. Um, gold is actually the most electronegative metal, and um, there are some compounds containing gold minus one ions which, you know, that was another lie we told you that metals always form cations. Now gold can form an anion. Oxidation states, transition metals, many of them can have several different oxidation states. Um, and so here's a graph showing us um, this first row of transition metals Manganese has the highest oxidation state. Um, so plus seven is the largest oxidation state that is observed. As you go, um, well, let's think about this. Manganese losing seven electrons. Let's look at the electron configuration for manganese. So that's argon, 4s2. And 3D5, right? If it loses seven electrons, that's all of those, right? It's isoelectronic with argon. So to the left of manganese on the periodic table, we see that all of these will form an ion that is isoelectronic with argon. Chromium. Um, only needs to lose six electrons, vanadium needs to lose five, titanium needs to lose four, and scandium needs to lose three. And they all do form an ion with that um, charge. Um, going to the right, um, most of these only form a positive two or positive three charge. When you lose the S electrons, that's when you get the plus two charge. And so that's very common. They've also indicated by the color of the dots that some of these are more common than others. Oops. 